appeal in the matter of McLean and others and Thornhill Casey. My ladies, I appear in this matter with Mr. Yeo and Mr. Winter, whilst my learned friend, Mr. Adam King's counsel, Mr. Schaefer, appear for the respondent. I'm going to need some help with Office 2, I'm afraid. Um, I'm not signed in, and I've done three cases in a row where something's gone wrong. And I, to be honest, I can't now remember which sign in, log in works and which one doesn't. But I'm sure there's somebody from Office 2 who can sort that out. Uh, don't they, don't they detain, detain us, please? Uh, it looks to me as that the gentleman here is the one who can provide assistance. Yeah. <coughs> yes, Mr. Sue. My Lord, the course that I propose to adopt subject, yep. of course, to the court, is to make some fairly brief uh, opening remarks yes. in relation to this case as a whole. I then propose to take you through, with a little bit of care, the documents, and in particular the documents which we say are crucial to the judge's finding that there was no duty in terms of the information memorandum, the subscription agreement, and those uh, are the documents upon which reliance is placed. Uh, I'm doing that to do that once yeah. and once only. I'm then going to deal with uh, the law in relation to tax and uh, identify what we say are the crucial errors which yeah. the judge made in relation to that. And then having done that, uh, I am going to make the core submissions uh, pretty briefly by reference to that, but pick up a couple of other matters which are on the fringes of the matter which don't arise directly out of it, such as, for example, the point in relation to the Unfair Contracts Terms Act and so forth. So that is the course that I intend yeah. to follow. The starting point, we say, is that this is actually an essentially straightforward case in which a professional knows that his advice is going to be used for selling an investment and expressly consents to such being used without disclaimer. And that professional makes careless statements which are, to his knowledge, intended to be used to induce sales of those investments to investors who suffer loss which would not have been suffered if the loss was correct. And so far as this case, so far from this case being at the fringes of the current law, we say that if analysed correctly, the answer has been, we say, obvious ever since Hedley Byrne overturned the uh, Court of Appeal judgment in Candler and Crane Christmas. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I will take you in my opening remarks to something which we say is directly on point and which shows the context. There are, we say, three critical interrelating matters which your Lordship and your Ladyship should bear in mind when we are going through the documents. The first is what we say is the judge's error in failing to consider this matter in the light and in the context of the fact that investments were being sold on written terms to individuals In that context, your Lordships may think that Lord Bridge, despite his unquestioned judicial attributes, would not be thought of 
as a judge who was leading the charge in terms of the extension of judicial duties. And I would like to draw your attention to what Lord Bridge, that well-known expander of uh, duties of care, had to say relevantly on this matter yep. in Caparo. And you will find Caparo in Authorities Bundle 2, tab 13, which if your bundles happen to be organised the same way as mine are, is the first of the authorities in yeah. file two. Like an old friend, Mrs Stewart. And sometimes the old friends are the ones where when you revisit them, you find qualities which you'd forgotten about <laughs> when it comes to looking at their familiar wrinkles. <clears throat> Lord Bridge starts to deal with the matter which uh, I want to show you at the bottom of page 620 on page 343 of the bundle. And he is discussing negligent advice cases. And in the passage which is highlighted, he says the salient feature of all of these cases is the defendant giving advice or information was fully aware of the nature of the transaction which the plaintiff had in contemplation, knew that the advice or information would be communicated to him directly or indirectly, and knew it was very likely that the plaintiff would rely on that advice or information in deciding whether or not to engage in the transaction in contemplation. In those circumstances, the defendant could clearly be expected, subject always to the effect of any disclaimer of responsibility, specifically to anticipate that the plaintiff would rely on the advice or information given by the defendant for the very purpose for which he uh, did in the event rely on it. And then at the bottom of the page, he cites a long passage from the dissenting judgment of Lord Justice Denning in Candler and Gate Crane Christmas. And you see that starting just above letter G at the bottom. And he's citing the passage which is after Lord Justice Denning had been negative about the arguments that were being put forward and was instead being constructive about the circumstances in which he said a duty of care would be owed. And at the top of page 623, still in the judgment, you see uh, Lord Denning saying, secondly, to whom do these professional people owe this duty? I'll take accountants, but the same reasoning applies to the others. They owe the duty, of course, to their employer or client. And also, I think, to any third person to whom they themselves show the accounts, or to whom they know their employer is going to show the accounts, so as to induce him to invest money or take some other action on them. But I don't think the duty can be extended still further so as to include strangers. And then, picking up the matter, at letter F, after referring to Chief Justice Cardozo's speech in Ultimares, he said um, whether he would be liable if he prepared his accounts for the guidance of a specific class of persons and a specific class of transactions, I don't say. I'm sure that it might be, just as the analyst and lift inspector will be liable in the instances I've given earlier. It is perhaps worth mentioning that Parliament has intervened to make the professional man liable for negligent error in reports given for the purposes of a prospectus, see sections 40 and 43 of the Companies Act 1948. That is an instance of liability for reports made for the guidance of a specific class of person, investors, in a specific class of transactions applying for shares. That enactment does not help one way or the other to show what result the common law would have reached in the absence of such provisions, but it does show what result it ought to reach. My conclusion is that a duty to use care in statement is recognised by English law and its recognition doesn't create any dangerous precedent when it's remembered that it's limited in respect to the persons by whom and to whom it's owed in the transactions to which it applies. And then Lord Bridge says this, it seems to me that this masterly analysis, if I may say so with respect, requires little if any amplification or modification in the light of later authority and is particularly apt to point the way to the right conclusion in the present appeal. So what you have there is Lord uh, Bridge quoting with highest approval the dissenting judgment in 1951 of Lord Denning relating to the relatively recently passed Companies Act 1948 
which did in fact materially restate provisions which in relation to directors had first been instituted in 1890 and in relation to experts a little bit later on. It is worth looking at those provisions of the Companies Act 1948. Um, in their originally, um, in their originally uh, uh, legislative form, you'll find them in bundle uh, five at tab 41. What, what we find when you do a trawl through the statutes is that uh, Parliament takes rather longer to say what it originally intended in 1890. The 1890 Directors' Liability uh, Act uh, would barely uh, begin to get on the statute book. It, it might um, get unnoticed, uh, so relatively short is it. The 1948 Act is longer, uh, but didn't contain, contain schedules and so forth, as we now have in the Financial Services and Markets Act. And what you have in the um, 1940, uh, at tab 41, is first of all, section 40. Yeah. And this is uh, a section which created a criminal offence. Uh, and what it did was experts consent to issue of prospectuses containing statements by him. A prospectus inviting persons to subscribe for shares in or debentures of a company, including a statement purported to be made by an exit, shall not be issued unless he, that's the expert, has given as not before delivery of a copy of the prospectus withdrawn his written consent. B, a statement he has given not withdrawn his consent appears in the prospectus. Two, if any prospectus is issued in contravention of this section, the company, every person is knowingly a part of the issue, shall be liable to a fine not exceeding £500. And then in relation to civil liability, the relevant section, section 43, which I hope you have at 1365. And this created um, civil liability uh, under section 43.1. And the categories were A, directors, B, people named as a director or who had agreed to become a director, C, promoters, and D, every person who's authorised the issue of the prospectus. And then there was a proviso, provided that where under section 40, the consent of a person is required for the issue of prospectus, and he's given that consent, he shall not, by reason of his having given it, be liable under this subsection as a person who's authorised the issue of the prospectus, except in respect of an untrue statement purporting to be made by him as an expert. So what that does is it makes the expert liable for statements attributed to him in a prospectus, but only for the ones which are attributed to him. Yeah. And, and then it gives, and just to pause there, it's absolutely plain that that involves statements of fact and statements of opinion. And if, in other words, if you say, my view is that this uh, property is with, worth 60 pounds a square foot or 500,000 pounds a year of rental or whatever it is, that's an opinion, it's a statement. If it's wrong, he's liable, unless by virtue of subsection two, one sees um, in D, uh, little one, as regard every untrue statement not to be made on the authority of an expert or a public official, he had reasonable grounds to believe and did up to the time of the allotment of shares of debentures believe the statement was true. And two, as regards every untrue statement purporting to be a statement by an expert or contain it or what purports to be a copy of or extract from a report or evaluation of expert, it fairly represented the statement or was a correct and fair-minded copy of or extract from the report or evaluations and he had reasonable grounds to believe, and did believe, up to the time of the issue, that the person making the statement was competent, etc. And in relation um, to uh, the expert himself, little three over the page, the expert should not be liable if he proves that, having given consent, he'd withdrawn it, or he becoming aware of the undrew statement which was consent, or little c, that he was competent to make the statement, and he had reasonable grounds to believe and did up to the time of the allotment of the shares, as the case may believe the statement was true. Now, these statutory provisions, which started in 1890 and followed public concern at the effect of the House of Lords restricting liability to negligence in relation to prospectuses to fraud in Derry and Peak, have been 
in English law since the 1890s. And what they do is provide a framework under which when securities are issued, the person who issues the security goes through and ticks off against every statement the grounds upon which he's relying on it, and in relation to if it's made by an expert, he gets the expert's consent and so forth. Now, these statutory provisions are not directly applicable to this case because these are not listing particulars, but they form the backdrop against which one has to look at the uh, documents in this case, and they explain the nature and the form of them. And I rely on Lord Denning's endorsement of what the answer ought to be, approved by Lord Bridge, as showing the fundamental approach in this case. What the judge did, fundamentally, was to approach this, looking at the documents, on an incredibly narrow basis. And the result was that he came to absurd conclusions. Those absurd conclusions would have destroyed the entitlement of the investors to rely on misstatements made by Scots, notwithstanding that on the very first page of the information memoranda, Scots expressly took responsibility for the relevant statements. And you can see, just to trail my coat a little bit further, just how influential this lack of approach was, when you look at what the judge said at paragraph 148 of his judgment on page 102. <clears throat> While we get there, I was just checking in the um, judgment, Mr. Stewart, to see where, if at all, the judge dealt with sections 14 and 43, where they draw his attention. Where they drawn to he his doesn't. attention? Okay. He doesn't. I don't, he had Caparo drawn to his attention. No. Did not, he have not those sections yeah. drawn? He to did his not, so far as I'm aware, have those sections drawn to his attention. He did not, so far as I'm aware, have the 1890 Act drawn to his attention. There was unquestionably some reference to the FISMA provisions, which mirror those now, but that was in the context of restrictions and collective investment schemes. Mm -hmm. He did not, so far as I'm aware, have drawn to his attention the uh, uh, equivalent provisions, which we, we will look at because it's important just to bear in mind what the actual provisions are, but which essentially mirror those in section 40, 40 and 43. Uh, but, but just looking at what is said on page 102, paragraph 148, he's dealing with a uh, submission about information and advice, and he says this, the fact that Scots assumed responsibility for the contents of the IM is not relevant to the question of whether Mr Thornhill assumed a uh, responsibility to invest to investors for his advice. Well, that, that is extremely difficult for reasons I will come on to, given that what you're looking at and seeking to construe is not any observations made by Mr Thornhill directly either in his advice or in the opinion. There's nothing saying you can't rely directly on Mr Thornhill. What is being said is that the effect of the information memoranda, the subscription memoranda, etc., was such as to give protection to uh, Mr Thornhill, even though his advice doesn't say anything about it at all. And so we say that this, um, there are a number of other matters, as uh, you will be aware, but... but this is at the heart of where this went wrong. And the consequences of that are, we submit, um, really quite extensive. Because this goes to what we say is the turning point of his analysis in relation to GGUK. Now, the second fundamental error that we say that he made was that he wrongly categorised the central complaint being made by the claimants. He categorised the complaint, as we shall see, 
in two stages. The first stage being that Mr. Thornhill got his advice. He was wrong about the tax consequences. And he went through and considered that a reasonably competent tax silk could have given advice based upon the Ensign Tankers case, essentially that the scheme works. We'll look at the details of that. And then secondly, he went and considered whether or not there should have been a duty to warn. But in doing so, he skipped over what was in fact the core complaint which was made and pleaded by my clients. And you see that... He he didn't do it in that order. He did do duty first and then breach. I'm not complaining about that. I'm on breach at the moment, my lady. I'm terribly sorry. No, no, I understand. I see. my, my, My complaint is that he wrongly categorised the case on breach in two stages. First, whether he was right or wrong, or more accurately, whether negligently he could have come to a conclusion that the scheme worked, and second, did look at advice. The central fault, however, was he didn't start with the question, could a competent tax silk have given advice that there was no doubt no doubt that the LLP would be trading and that there was no problem with the question as to whether or not the test of trading on a commercial basis was, um, uh, was passed. Now, the complaint here was not... Do you say there's a difference between those two points? Isn't that just one point? Or is that, are there two points? So Sorry, could, could competent tax silk have given advice that there was no doubt the LLP would be trading and no problem with test of trading on a commercial basis? Sorry, no, you do say that's two separate points. I, I do say there are two separate points yes, on sorry. breach. But yeah. the fundamental point that I'm making at the moment, your, ladies, your ladyship is right to pick me up on it, is that he doesn't consider not just whether he was right or wrong about these, but whether a competent tax silk could say there was no problem and no doubt about the two central issues. So it's the unqualified nature of the advice. It's the the certainty. Yes. And and the reason why uh, we do make subsidiary complaints about lack of risk warnings and so forth, but as I'll show you, perhaps the easiest way is to to look at the, um, the pleadings in this context. Core Bundle 2, Particulars of Claim, tab 14, page 227. Did you say 247? 227, my name. These are the particulars of breach of duty, paragraph 49. First, breach of duty, negligently advised in unequivocal terms in the sad one and sad two opinion that there was no doubt there is a trade being carried on. In reality, the opposite was true. Alternatively, the true position was far less certain that ATQC had advised and there was a significant risk that schemes would be successfully challenged. Now, the the, the reason for this is that in selling, and that he knew was what was going to be done with his advice, certainty is very important. Voltaire, in 1770, wrote a letter to his sometime sponsor, the then Crown Prince of Prussia. Il n'y a que des charlatans qui soient certain. Le doute n'est pas un état bien agréable, mais la science, c'est un état ridicule. Doubt is an uncomfortable condition, but certainty is a ridiculous one. 
what was being done here was to say there was no doubt and no problem. And that mattered. And it mattered for this reason. It was those opinions which were reflected in the information memorandum, memoranda, which he approved. If he had said that there was any doubt, any material doubt, any material doubt about the tax consequences, that would have to have been reflected in the information memorandum. And it would have to have been reflected in the information memorandum because Scots would otherwise have been guilty of a misrepresentation. And so what you had was a situation where his opinions, made available if investors asked for them, were directly reflected in the information memorandum. Now, I, I'm sure that all the members of this bench, whilst they were at the bar, were far more bullish on matters than I ever was. But I would ask you to reflect <laughs> how many times... I don't know why you think that. <laughs> how many times... I, I, my recollection is a long, long time ago, in my case, longer than anybody else's, is that I regarded 70% as a slam dunk. <laughs> and I'm sure you told your clients that, by the way. Yeah, I do, frequently. <laughs> But the, the moment the, you get into court, goodness only knows what will happen. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, there, is, there, is, there, there is, however, a very, a very serious point here. Mm. The, 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 the certainty is the central complaint that is being made. Because as soon as this became uncertain, three things happened. First, you would have to be off your head to invest in this scheme. These schemes depended upon tax advantages to generate a relatively modest profit. If they didn't exist, then absent the truly extraordinary, about the same chance as winning a lottery ticket if you pay five pounds now for your Euro Millions ticket on, um, on uh, Saturday night, you were going to be making a loss. Mm. Secondly, it mattered because of the existence of duty. The true test, as we shall come to, I accept, is in negligent misstatement cases, whether or not looking at the situation objectively, there is a reasonable assumption of responsibility, the law imposes responsibility reasonably upon the giver of the statement, and he ought to appreciate that his statement will be relied upon. But in this case, what the statement is matters. Malone Friend's case on analysis depends upon the saying that despite the terms in which his client advised, and despite the terms which were reflected in the information memoranda, each of these investors could and should have gone to another tax silk to operate the scheme separately. Now, he hedges around about what is meant by independent advice and so forth. And we'll have to look at what the authorities say about that. But that's in reality what his case comes down to. Now, if you imagine a situation where someone says, you cannot rely on my advice, proceed at your own peril, then first of all, you don't need to go that far because you've got a plain Headley Burn disclaimer. But secondly, if in truth you are looking at someone who is peddling certainty, then the chances of you thinking, well, I need to go off and get an advice from someone else, are radically diminished. Speaking out loud and entirely for myself, uh, are there any authorities, are there any submissions on the question of partial reliance? That is to say, um, advice is given, uh, relied upon, but also 
independent advice taken or that the original advice still plays a part in the overall assessment. Do, for the first purpose of the NRAM test, I suppose I'm saying, does it, okay. does it have to be exclusive reliance or can it be partial reliance? So we're going to come on to NRAM. No, 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 but it's, it, it's, it, with respect, it, it is important, my lady. At this stage of the analysis, we are looking for something which precludes the existence of a duty of care. There is absolutely no doubt at all that partial reliance can and does exist in the sense that you can rely on one advisor and get confirmatory advice from another. A barrister gives you advice, a solicitor affirms it. In Candler against Crane Christmas itself, the circumstances were, as I'm sure you all remember, that there was going to be a £2,000 investment by the claimant. And the claimant went along to the Cornish tin mine and saw the uh, clerk of the defendant accountants. And he copied out the accounts, that was before photocopiers, and he took them back to his own accountant. And his own accountant looked at them, came up with some questions, and he went back to them. There you have an example of uh, partial reliance. And when one in truth looks at the authorities properly, and I, I will do this, I wasn't intending to do it now, although I can, but I'll just give you my submissions so you know where I'm, I'm going, my key submissions in relation to this. At the stage of the existence of a duty, it is only if the independent advice is such as to negative the duty, make it unreasonable, or possibly my friend, my learned friend would say more accurate, make it not reasonable, that one is in this territory. And there are authorities in the bundles of saying that the effect of a disclaimer, or call it what you will, um, does not necessarily negate the existence of a duty. Well, one needs to be very careful about that. If you've got a clear disclaimer saying you cannot rely on my advice, then it's only if you're in Smith and Bush territory, if I can put it that way. <laughs> but if you're saying get your own, rather than saying you can't, but saying positively get your own advice. There, there are three relevant considerations here to take into account, my lady. The first is what do you mean by independent advice? My learned friend's fallback is to <coughs> say, well, look, all of these people had um, independent financial advisors. Independent financial advisors could be anyone. I mean, I say anyone, anyone who's licensed and so forth. They can be insurance brokers. They don't have to have any tax um, expertise. Their function in the regulatory regime is to make sure that risks are understood in broad terms. We'll come in a little bit to the information memorandum, or we'll see that actually this information memorandum isn't quite as, as soon as that. But the, the, fun, the, fun, the fact that you've got an IFA doesn't mean anything at all. The existence of other advisors will occur in almost every transaction. So it, it can't simply be that you've got other advisors. It's got to actually be the fact that you will be presumed to take advice on the very subject upon which you've been provided from someone who is in as good a position and as experienced as the person whose advice you've been given. And I just want to finish off my third point, just to, to make the point. All of this is in the context of duty. This court will be well familiar with the fact that inducement, even in relation to, well, inducement in relation to non-fraudulent contracts can simply be proved by reliance. It doesn't have to be exclusive reliance. The fact that you rely on one person and on another person doesn't preclude you from 
going forward with that reliance in relation to the second part of the test. To preclude that reliance has to be truly extraordinary. You have to have effectively a, a, a novus actus. But at the moment, I am simply on the um, consequences of the central complaint and the failure of the judge to look at this. Now, we do say the judge was wrong for reasons I'll come to. We we'll do say that the position was clear. We do say that they should have been given risk warnings. But before all of that, the judge had to consider this simple question. Could Mr. Thornhill non-negligently have advised that there was no doubt that the entity would be trading and that he saw no problem with the entity trading on the commercial basis? And we say as soon as you put in those terms, it's clear he could not give that. We say it becomes abundantly plain when you look, as we will look, at the absolute starting point in relation to the um, relevant statutory tests. <coughs> the third point that we want to make at this point, and I'm, I'm going to come in a little bit of detail, is what we say are the central errors in relation to the tax position. Now, I will run through all of the errors, but we do say that they were basic and in one respect interplayed quite importantly with the question of risk, which I've already identified. The judge was somehow persuaded by Mr. Thornhill that the decision of Mr. Justice Millet in Ensign Tanker, Tankers or the House of Lords in the same case somehow permitted a principle that where one entity which was trading transferred part of its business to another entity, that entity would itself be conclusively presumed to be trading. Well, that's just not what the authorities say. Ensign Tankers simply does not support the judge's conclusions on that. Secondly, when you actually look at the statutes and then look at how they have been applied, it is, we say, completely obvious that whether an entity is trading or not is always to be viewed as a multifactorial assessment. There is no one golden bullet, no one test which allows you to say that is definitely trading. There are instead a whole series of indicia which have been taken into account. By way of example only, if you trade in something only once, sorry, if you transact in something only once, it is an indication that you are not trading by way of another example. If you hold something for a relatively long time, it is an, it is an indicia, a, a pointer to you not being trading. And the so-called badges of trade were an attempt to identify on a non-exclusive basis matters which are taken into account. Now, to those of us who haven't spent our um, working lives, appearing first in front of commissioners and then in front of tribunals and so forth, um, I, I remind myself, not of course this court, that the assessment of whether or not, for example, an entity is trading will be undertaken by the fact-finding body in relation to it. So to say 
that there is no doubt that an entity will be traded is equivalent to saying, my Lord, Lord Justice, sorry, my Lord, the Chancellor, will find this as a fact. It's, it's a bold proposition. The second point in relation to uh, uh, the breaches, or the next point in relation to breaches, is that the judge found that save in one respect, which he found helped Mr Thornhill, which is the possible application of sale and leaseback schemes, the Inland Revenue Manuals, which were published, were of no assistance to him in deciding the case. And he did that on the basis that the Inland Revenue Manuals are meant to reflect the law. Three points about that. Sorry, the um, paragraph numbers in the judgment for the uh, IN discussion. The, sorry, um, the manual discussion. The manual discussion is at um, just... Um, uh, sorry, find the. Uh, um, sorry. Yes. Two, two, five, five, I think. Yes, I think that's right, Lady. I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, no, I've got a note. I've got a note, not in yes. the uh, correct. Yes, thank you. Yes. 225, it's exactly right. As for the numerous revenue manuals, I'd say in wrong respect, I do not find these of much assistance. They're not a source of the law of time, we're intended to reflect. The law. The law is to be found in the legislation and the decisions of the courts. Well, with respect, there are three problems about that. The first is that the manuals don't just reflect the law. They reflect the Inland Revenue statement of what they consider the law to be, but also, on some occasions, indications as to what will and will not be challenged. There are occasions within the Inland Revenue Manuals when they say, subject to the following, for example, this isn't a tax avoidance scheme, we will not challenge X or Y, and there will no doubt be good reasons for that, normally because the consequences of challenging that in that case will mean that they don't get taxed from somewhere else. But, I mean, the, the, in other words, they can, they can set out what are effectively extra statutory concessions. And so what the judge said there is simply not right. But secondly, because they say what the Inland Revenue believes the law to be, <clears throat> if in fact you um, believe that you're right, because your tax silk has told you that you're right, but the revenues guidance says the opposite, then you are likely to have a battle on your hands, or at the very least, there is a real prospect of having a battle on your hands. And in the context of being sold investments, where we rely on the existence of um, tax relief, having a battle with the inland revenue is not actually something which you want as a desirable outcome. And the third problem is the information memorandum, the memoranda, which were expressly approved by Mr Thornhill, state in terms that they are in accordance with law and practice. Referring to the Current, current practice. Yes, sorry, of course. Oh, my lady, I, I completely accept that the Inland Revenue is entitled to and does change its yeah, practice. It does. Um, and sometimes there are fights about whether it's entitled yeah. or not to do so. And some members of this court yeah. have experience of such yeah. fights. Mm -hmm. um, but, 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 but current practice, absolutely. But the, the point is that if your scheme doesn't fall within current practice, or worse, there are indications that it is outside current practice, then even if you're right on the law, you're setting yourself up for a battle. Now, just 
flowing through that a little bit further. These investors, and this is my last point by way of introduction, were portrayed at trial as engaging in high octane tax avoidance. In the opening parts of my learned friend's skeleton argument for this appeal, he identifies Mr. Miller, who was one of the trial selected claimants. And he says, Mr. Miller took his own advice and that it would be an outrage if in those circumstances the law were to impose a duty of care on Mr. Thornhill in relation to the advice given. I am going to go through with you what Mr. Miller's uh, advice was and what was said. But at this stage, before we look at the documents, can I just give you some figures? There were 110 claimants. They invested varying different amounts. The gross amount of the investment, of course, was substantially more than the net amount if they took account of the tax relief and the uh, availability of loans, but, but there we are. Mr. Miller was the only one out of the 110 claimants to take any alternative legal advice. Uh, I'm sorry to rise, I don't, I, I'm not a natural interrupter. Uh, uh, that's factually inaccurate, and that Mr. Rogers took. Yeah, I do, I, um, it depends if my learned friend means advice from a lawyer. I do mean advice from a lawyer. Legal, legal advice can, of course, be given by other professionals. I'm sorry to, so, I'm so, so sorry to interrupt. To make the point that I was going to make, but I think Mr. Adam might want to be making, another seven out of the 110 sorry. took advice in one form or another from an accountant. So out of the 110, 102 took no other advice. So they all signed warranties saying they had done but didn't. Well, when you come to the warranties, that's the, um, you'll see that in my respectful submission, when you look at them, uh, they don't do that. They had of a course, right. they had of a course, all of them did have IFAs. Right. And no IFAs have been sued? No, well, I don't actually know that to be a case, the case, but I'm, I'm not aware that they have been. Um, Forgive me, <coughs> on, on some of these matters, I'd, I'd hesitate before giving absolute advice, but I, I'm certainly not aware that they have been. And the information you're giving us, can we get, there's a very helpful table somewhere which I've momentarily lost. Which yeah. can, I, can I, can I, do you, do you mind if I do that when no, I get no, to no, Mr. Absolutely. Miller? I'm, uh, for present purposes, I'm identifying these points, not absolutely to make them good, because I want to pick up some other points, but for you to have them in mind when we come to the point which um, my lady, Lady Justice Simler, has just said to me, well, they all warranted that they had taken advice. I'm simply drawing to your attention at this point that these people, these wealthy, relatively wealthy individuals who sign documents and so forth and are being portrayed as engaging in high octane tax avoidance, either are prepared to sign anything which comes in front of them, or actually haven't been given any kind of warning, or don't believe that what they are signing is contradictory. And when one looks, I say, at what the documents actually say when one looks at them, that gives you a pointer as to how you actually construe these documents. Now, my lord, my ladies, that are, those are the introductory points that I wanted to make. What I want to do now is I want to just, first of all, go through the critical documents um, in the light of the observations I've made and also in the light of the submissions which we've made in our skeleton argument. 
uh, <coughs> I will. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I will, if I may, remind you first of all of the um, chronology which you have at Core Bundle One, Tab Seven. Now, for the purposes of this appeal, as you know, we are not concerned with SAD 1. We are concerned with SAD 2 and SAD 3. The background is, however, and this is common ground and explained in the judgment, that Mr Thornhill's involvement with these schemes um, started in August of 2002, as one sees on page 64, when he is approached for advice by Scots in relation to film distribution schemes and advice on various matters that followed. Now the context of that is therefore that he's being advised on the setting up of these schemes. And the reason I draw that to your attention is that from then onwards, and there's a whole series of notes and meetings and so forth which lead to it, he's looking at the architecture of these, scene, these, these um, schemes. Plainly, at that point, he is doing so from the perspective and point of view of Scots as the issuer of these schemes. Equally plainly, at that point, if he's telling them these schemes won't work, or even there's a significant risk that they won't work, these schemes won't go any further because they're not going to be able to be sold on the back of a memorandum which would have to say, we thought of this wonderful idea, but it doesn't work, or there's a substantial chance that it won't work. What then happens is that um, he is given formal instructions in relation to uh, sad one and one sees those being recorded and the reference is at core bundle to tab 16 just before Christmas of 2002 page 326 of core bundle 2 where he sent the draft information memorandum for SAD 1. And what he's asked, on behalf of Scott Private Client Services, I hereby formally request you review the information memorandum in general, the tax section, section especially, and provide us in letter form confirmation that you are in agreement with the contents of the said tax section. <coughs> As discussed, it's our intention to include your letter as part of the information memorandum in the short term, and in the new year to request a long-form opinion which would be included within a revised information memorandum. Now, just to pause here, as the uh, judge explains in his judgment, in the event, which I think it's fair to say are lost for reasons of time, uh, sorry, lost by reason of the fluction of time, in other words, that effectively pretty well 20 years have passed since, um, since this was done, the reasons why that didn't happen are not plain. But what this does show is that from the start, he knew, Thornhill knew, that he was being asked to approve the information memorandum in general and the taxation section especially. And he knew at that point that his advice was going to be relied on and indeed his letter was going to go as part of the information memorandum. Now, in the context of the statutory regime of which I have shown you, we haven't looked yet at the 1980 Act, but for material purposes, in my submission, it is clear. This is um, Scott saying two things. First, we're relying on you for the information memorandum. Secondly, your advice 
is going to be relied on and made directly available to investors. Then what happens is that he gets formal instructions in relation to SAD 1, and those formal instructions are found in the reform in the in the form of the trading memorial, sorry, the memorial, which is at the next tab of the bundle, tab 17. And you see it being recorded since August 2002, so now um, four or five months previously, the council has been asked to opine on a number of issues and questions raised in relation to the above. This was done in a number of letters, instructions to councils, meetings and telephone conversations. The purpose of this document is to collate all the questions and issues raised by Scots in relation to the above with a view to seeking a written opinion from council. And he then says it's cross-referenced. And what he's then done, and we have the underlying documents, but it doesn't matter for present purposes, is that there are a series of points which are raised by reference to the previous advice. And the first arises out of a con on the 1st of November 2002. And the first question which is raised is in relation to trading. It is projected that the LLP will incur trading losses in the first two tax years unless the performance of the slate is exceptional. That's my lottery ticket. Members may wish to set these off against other income. That's a bit of an understatement. In order that relief for these trading losses is available to the members, it's important that the LLP is considered to be carrying on a trade in the UK on a commercial basis with a view to realising a profit. Those are the three critical elements of the combined statutory test. Council is therefore asked to consider the following. Does Council consider the LLP will be carrying on a trade in the UK and the relief will be available to members under any other income? So that's the trading requirement. Council will note even if only the minimum guarantees are received, it's anticipated that the LLP will make a profit over the full trading period. Two, does Council consider the use of the studio's subsidiaries to substitute the films would impact upon the LLP trading status? And then three, does Council consider the terms of the profit sharing arrangements between the studio and the LLP and the substitutors, subdistributors will be considered to be consistent with trade being carried on, and you can put in there, A, on a commercial basis, and B, with a view to realising a profit, because those are different elements of the statutory test. Four, are there any other actions, documentation which Council considers could be put in place to more clearly evidence trading? Uh, and then there's a, a point about not falling foul of section 184 of ICTA. Now, can I also just draw your attention to the overall reanalysis on page 330? Under E, does council consider that the inland revenue could be successful? in seeking to reanalyze the tax treatment of any trading losses arising and the proceeds of sale in the event of the studio acquiring the LLP interest. Would Council's view be any different if the minimum guarantees were also backed up by a letter of credit from their bank, either on day one or in six months' time? In this respect, Council is asked to consider this in the light of the new BM, BIM 56190, applying to sale and lease backs transactions i.e. if the rules set out in the BIM were complied with and a guarantee was received, could this transaction be differentiated from sale and leasebacks? So he's specifically asked to look at the analogy with sale and leasebacks, and just for the avoidance um, of um, any possible doubt upon any member of the court, the re 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 relevance of that comes in to whether or not the judge had any basis for drawing, as it were, any satisfaction from the terms in which he did about the possible analogy with sale and leaseback. And to, to trail my coat a little further, in this field of life, as in possibly certain others, plain vanilla doesn't mean a form of ice cream. It's actually referred to by the revenue um, as plain vanilla schemes. And for present purposes, we say um, this wasn't a sale and leaseback, Sale and leaseback were given specific statutory encouragement. 
Gordon Brown, for reasons known only to him and the Almighty, decided that um, the film industry was worthy of special treatment at the expense of the rest of us, and the Inland Revenue said that in relation to plain vanilla schemes, which met certain criteria, uh, effectively they wouldn't uh, challenge them. But well, that's sections 42 and 48 of... The that, that's the that's the Gordon consent. that's the that's the Gordon Brown special. So it yes. wasn't the revenue; it was a par parliamentary legislation. Y yes, but the the point I was making about the um, about the the revenue was that the revenue then said, provided these are dealt with effectively, we won't we will we'll treat them as trading. Well, that's one wow. possible interpretation. Microfusion but, and Halcyon challenged them. Yeah. So I'm not sure the revenue said they won't challenge well, them. But anyway, it, but, there, it was a, it was specific legislation designed to encourage. Uh, investment in the film industry. Uh, Milady, I couldn't agree more. C can I just make, make two other points, though, in, in that context? The first is that um, all of this guidance, including that, was in the context of it not being tax avoidance. And sale and leaseback schemes were not avoiding tax, they were deferring tax. Yeah. Yes, I mean, there's a gentleman sitting behind me who might be better placed to uh, enter into debates with your ladyship, but um, um, what we say when we look at the relevant guidance is that if the scheme was vanilla, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, we won't challenge it, but Halcyon was not a vanilla scheme. In other well, words, Halcyon wasn't because there was a double dip that mi microfusion is. I do. Anyway, can, we, we will come back to this, but can I, but a, can I just... Can I just um, emphasize for present purposes that he has got in his instructions consideration, admittedly in a slightly different context, of sale and lease, lease back. And, and what then happens is that we get the first SAD1 opinion. Now this is in very similar terms to the SAD2 and SAD3 opinion, but I will, will go to it if I may because it forms part of the history. And this is at tab uh, 18. And what Mr. Thornhill does under paragraph one in relation to trading question, the first question is whether the proposed LLP is trading. In my view, there is no doubt that it is. And then he says why, in essence, Part of the overall activities of the business which Warner Brothers and its associated companies carry on is being passed over to the LLP. This, I'm just pausing there, not entirely grammatically clear what it's being referred to, is inherently a commercial activity carried on the same way as similar activities in the commercial world. It may perhaps be said it's not really a separate identical part of that activity, in other words, although the essence of a trade is that it is a commercial activity carried on in the same way as analogous activities in the commercial world, CCI and Livingston, nevertheless, that doesn't mean you can take part of what would normally be the overall commercial activity and contend that's part of a trade. The answer is that in the film world, persons exist who do carry on a separate activity such as the LLP carries on. It's inherently much less risky than producing a film. In my opinion, therefore, there is here the commercial activity with parallels, note the word parallels, in the real world and carried on the same commercial way as occurs in the film world. There is a trade. Now, it is obvious from this that he is providing emphatic advice. He's doing so not by reference to the underlying statutes or what they require, or whether the trading test is met, or whether, in fact, this is going to be a question of fact for the tribunal. But he's giving that advice, we would say, as a matter of law based upon the matters he set out. When you say no loss, but nothing... And by reference to the underlying statutes, you mean the tax statutes? I do. But the tax statutes have been identified by Scots, and Scots are, are part and parcel of devising the architecture of this scheme. They yeah. are 
sophisticated, knowledgeable clients in this context, and they know full well what the issues are and what the risks are, and they're having they're they're going to Mr. Thornhill for confirmation of those points, not for a from the start explanation of what the what the legislation requires and what the sorts of indicia might be that might be needed. They are as sophisticated as Mr. Thornhill in this context. Is that um, fair? Well, I'm not sure about as sophisticated. No. Uh, I mean, the, the point for going through advice is normally, but, 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 but they're certainly sophisticated, my lady. Now, having given that emphatic advice, which doesn't consider whether or not there is in fact trading at all from the bottom, it, it states a conclusion based on the Passover. He goes to a second question at the top of page 339. Could the revenue argue nevertheless there is something artificial about this trade? In effect, the LLP acquires rights from Warner Brothers and then disposes them back again. And he goes on to consider the LLP looks have been placed in the middle of a commercial operation and he goes on to say that in days gone by, such an argument would have great credence, and he refers to Lupton. Yeah. And then he says this, what it does, this is Lupton, establish is that if the way a trade is carried on for tax or other reasons is substantially different from the way it's carried on commercially, then it's no longer a trade. In other words, if the S activity is not carried on the way that it would be carried on in the commercial world, it may well not be a trade. If that's the principle, it doesn't affect the LLP here. Well, j just on that, that is a categoric <coughs> assertion as, in fact, to a matter of fact. And then he says, in my view, the correct principle was followed in the House of Lords and Ensign Tankers. And he refers to Lupton and the decision of Mr. Justice Park in Berkeley's Mine Law. In my opinion, the current position in law is that if a taxpayer carries on a commercial activity in a commercial way, although his motive may be to obtain a tax advantage, although he's sandwiched into a larger commercial activity, this activity is and remains a trade. I believe this answers questions one, two, and three. And then just picking up what he says uh, about no problem, I turn therefore to question five, this concerns lost relief against other income. It's axiomatic the trade is tacked under case one. In my view, the LLP's trade is clearly controlled from the UK as taxable under case one of Schedule D. Subsection four of section 381 requires the trade to be carried on a commercial basis. Brackets, here I see no problem. So that's where I say that in relation to the two critical elements in relation to our criticism, his advice is no doubt as to trading, no problem as to commercial basis. Uh, it doesn't matter, but um, that was actually part of question three, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. But it he was. goes back, as it were, to yes. the issue, having I mean, answered question three on the face I, of it. I mean, as a matter of analysis, one of the mistakes which we say the judge made here is to treat the commercial basis test as being rolled up within the trading test. And, and we say that as a matter of law, that's just wrong. But isn't that how he was invited to approach it? No. Okay. No. Okay. No, it wasn't. At all times on our side, we were making it plain that the commercial basis test was different and supplemental to the element sometimes referred to as commerciality, yeah. which is indicative in the trading test. I, 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 I'm, I'm sure all members of the court have, have got this, but from a, a revenue perspective, if you're trading, in very simple terms, you're liable to income tax. Mm. If you're trading on a commercial basis, you're entitled to um, additional uh, relief. Tax relief. Uh, the revenue is therefore very keen, or quite keen, to say that people are trading. Uh, it's not quite it's so keen to say, to say that people... <laughs> <laughs> and there, therefore, 
if you are a dilettante, um, if you are a dilettante antiques dealer who only opens every second Tuesday between four o'clock in the afternoon and five o'clock in the afternoon, but you happen to have the Mona Lisa coming across your well, actually a bad idea, but you happen to have something very valuable which produces a large trade, you get taxed on the profits, but they're very li less likely to give you the um, relief on the losses uh, on the basis that um, they, um, they, d they don't think you're trading on a commercial basis. So that's, that, and the judge went wrong about that, but in answer to my lady's question, no, he was not um, uh, misled in relation to that uh, point. But coming back to my lady, Lady Justice Carr's point, yes, one of these slight oddities about this is that he wraps up questions one, two, and three, which are separate in his conclusion. But he, done, he does then come back to um, uh, he does then come back to um, to, 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 to the point in there. And then can can I then just draw your attention to the other point which I want in relation to this, which is at 344. Overall reanalysis. This is in response to the point where sale and leasebacks have been raised with him. Mm. In my opinion, the analysis set out, uh, set, so far set out in his opinion, losses and capital profits is correct. I do not see it makes any difference that guarantees are backed. It only strengthens the guarantee. I fail to see how the transactions could be recharacterized as a sale and lease back, given the LLP's ability to make additional profits. So he's saying in terms, these are not sale and lease, back, lease, and lease backs, and they can't be recategorized as such. And I, I only draw that to your Lordship's attention in relation to the, um, the, the, the point which is being put forward. Now, what then happens is the uh, first stage of the SAD1 goes out, it actually closes on the 4th of April. It, it doesn't matter for present purposes. There's something of a, a mystery as to whether or not there had been expressed confirmation given to the information memorandum. But what he does is he sends the letter in relation to SAD1, which is found at page 348. And as it were, retrospectively, because as I say, SAD1 has already gone out the door and it's um, Closed on the 18th of July, he refers to the information memorandum and confirms for the purposes of your internal verification that he consented by my name being used in the information memorandum, his text advised the sponsor, and in the section of the information memorandum headed taxation consequences investing in a partnership to a copy of my opinion issues on etc. being made available to prospective investors. And then I have read the information memorandum, particularly the section of the information headed taxation consequences, and confirm there is no statement contained there in relation to taxation matters, which is inconsistent with my opinion. Then what happens is that um, the um, possibility comes of having SAD 2 and SAD 3, and indeed possibly other LLPs, because there was particular concern that in raising money, what might happen is that particular distributors would want to have their own SAD attached to them. <clears throat> and there is then a very similar um, memorial being sent to Mr. Um, Thornhill, which is directly in relation to SADs 2 and 3. And you see that at uh, Core Bundle 2, page 20. Tab 20. Sorry, tab 20. Tab 20. Page 349. <coughs> Can I just draw, draw some points out in relation to this? Scott's proposed to sponsor a further series of LLPs during the tax year to enable high net worth individuals to participate in the business of distributing feature length films. Scots will again be providing tax advice to the LLPs. Uh, and then you see the explanation which I've just given as to the possibility of effectively exclusive conduct in paragraph two. Then paragraph three, intended the draft of information manner will be produced following consultation with council, and the council would again opine on the taxation section and allow his name to be shown as tax counsel to the LLP. 
And what's then sent to him is the um, LLP for the second distribution, the opinions provided, etc., the executive summaries and so forth. And what one then sees is a uh, series of requests being made. And what is referred to as the short form advice, mm -hmm. which is given at page 355. And the opinion on the short form, I've read the section headed taxation consequences in the draft I am, approve the content, there's a point about partners' capital contributions. Um, I confirm the statement of taxation consequences appears to me to be complete, not to contain any material emissions. I confirm the statement attributed to me under non-resident partner, what is page 19 in my copy of the IM. J just there, that's a particular risk, which we'll see when we get to the IM, which he flags up and which is identified directly to the investors. I confirm the accuracy of the statements under expected tax outcome in the section headed the offer. The statements under tax risks in the section headed risk factors are in my view, it actually says A, accurate and complete. I think that simply must be accurate and complete. Now when we get to them, you will see that what there isn't flagged up in the tax risks is that actually the relief upon which the whole scheme is founded is not available. Then we get the um, confirmation letter on the 20th of October. It's not available or may not be available. And there is a risk it may not be available. You uh, say what is not flagged up. Not, not, neither. There is no, there is no, well, 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 perhaps the best thing is to look at the risks and then... And then Mr. Stewart, we normally uh, are asked to take a five minute break for the transcribers around about now. Uh, a convenient moment to take a break. Who does any other? I'm afraid I'm going to be ploughing through the documents for a bit longer. Yeah, I mean, I just yes. picked the moment when yes. you were drawing breath. Yes. You, you, you waited for a convenient gap in the middle of a word, my lord. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope not. <laughs> if we could stick to five minutes, that'd be helpful. The relevant provisions of this law are now in the 
We're about to go through the SAD 2 and 3 information yeah. memorandum, but just before we do so, can I just take you to the statutory provisions yeah. which are applicable? Now, the equivalent of sections 40 and 43 of the Companies Act, I'll make it absolutely plain, these are not uh, directly applicable to the situation. They only come in in the way that I've identified um, as what the common law should be. But those statutory provisions are to be found in bundle five, mm -hmm. and you will find uh, them at tab um, 46.
And I, I hope your bundles have been updated so that you have the copies of the provisions which were in effect at the time that the uh, Mr. Thornhill was giving his advice and the memoranda were being circulated. Because originally you had the current versions of those which um, have some differences in them. Can I, can I just check that your bundles have been updated? Well, we've got at page 1408, FISMA version 1 of 1, 1st of December 2001 to the present. Yes. It depends on when present is, I suppose. <laughs> But I'm assuming that's the original version. That, 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 that's the version, version which is the relevant. That, that's the version of the relevant one. Okay. Can I can I can I just draw your attention uh, to the as it were the, the way that the current statutory scheme works? Section eighty is the general duty of disclosure and listing particulars. Sorry, I'm sorry, tab fifty-five. I'm told by my mentor very helpfully. Tab 55. Okay. Section 80. So section 80 is the general duty of disclosure. Listing particulars submitted to the competent authority under section 79 must contain all such information as investors and their professional advisors would reasonably require, reasonably expect to find there for the purpose of making an informed assessment assets and liabilities, financial position, profits and losses, prospects of the issuer and securities, and the rights attached to the securities. Uh, section 81 uh, is effectively dealing with changes in the requirement for um, uh, supplementary listing particulars. Mm -hmm. Section 90 is the statutory compensation for false or misleading particulars. Um, any person responsible for listing particulars liable to pay compensation to a person who has acquired the securities, etc., etc., suffered loss as a result of any untrue or misleading statement of particulars or the omission of particulars of any matters which is to be included by section 80 or 81. Mm -hmm. And then Schedule 10 is in relation to exemptions. Schedule 10. Statements believed to be true. In this paragraph, statement means any true or misleading statement, the omission from the listing particulars of any matter required to be included. A person doesn't incur liability under section 91 for loss caused by a statement. If he satisfies the court at the time when the listing particulars were submitted to the competent authority, he reasonably believed, having made such inquiries of any as were reasonable, A, the statement was true and not misleading, or B, the matter whose omission caused the loss was properly admitted. And that one or more of the conditions set out in subparagraph three are satisfied. Conditions are continued ease of belief until the time when the securities were required. They're required before it's reasonably practical to bring a correction. Before the securities are required, he'd taken all such steps as reasonable to be taken to ensure that a correction was brought to the attention of those parties. He continued his belief after the commencement of details in the securities following their admission to the official list, etc. And then statements by experts at, at paragraph two. In this paragraph, state means a statement including listed particulars, which purports to be made by or on the authority of another person as an expert, stated to be included in the list in particulars that other person's consent. A person does not include incur any liability under section 91 for loss in respect to any securities caused by a statement. If he satisfies the court the time when the listing particulars are submitted, he reasonably believed the other person was competent to make or authorise, had consented to its inclusion. One or more of the conditions in subparagraph three are satisfied. Conditions are that he continued his belief until securities were required, uh, etc. Uh, and then responsibility at section six for listing particulars. Um, uh, six little three is effectively the possibility for limited authorization of particulars. <coughs> And little four, you should see, nothing in this regulation is to be construed as making a person responsible for any particulars by reason of giving advice as to their contents in a professional capacity. So that's the current, um, that's the current, uh, as it were, equivalent of sections 40 and 43 
Sorry, uh, the then current. Sorry, the, the, the then current. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So in 1890, it's said in the page. In 1948, it's in three pages. And in 2007, about 15 pages. <laughs> I think it's a bit more than that, but yes, so it's, my essentially <laughs> it's essentially the same point. It's essentially the same point. There are a few changes in page. Yeah, sure. But, but yes. Now, the, the second set of um, statutory regime is, is directly relevant. Now, it, it, it goes to this point. One of the points which is made by the judge and by uh, the learned friends is that this memorandum was addressed and could only be addressed to IFI, uh, IFAs, not directly to the investors. Now, th there are two problems with that. The first is that when one actually looks at the memoranda, it is actually absolutely plain that there are passages which are speaking directly to the end clients. And I want you to have that in mind when we go through them. And the second is that with respect, that is an oversimplification, at the very least, of the statutory regime. What the statutory regime um, involves is a prohibition effectively, on providing um, advertisements for investments and so forth in very broad terms, subject to limited exemptions. And for these purposes, there are three relevant exemptions. And the exemptions are to be found in the pithily titled regulations, the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000 and Promotion of Collective Investment Schemes Exemptions Order 2001 16, 1060, yeah. which is at tab 5 of page 47. Now, the investments professionals. Sorry, tab 5. It's tab, fo tab 47, by sorry, the way. Oh, 47. 47. That's the second part of my mistake. I apologize. Okay. Bundle 5, tab 47. I'm grateful for my learning. Yeah. <clears throat> Article 14 is investment professionals for present purposes, IFAs. So page 14, 14. Mm -hmm. The scheme promotion restriction, which is what I've just referred to, does not apply to any communication which A, is made only to recipients whom the person making the communication believes on reasonable grounds to be investment professionals, or B, may reasonably be regarded as directly only at such recipients. For the purposes of paragraph 1B, if all the conditions set out in paragraphs 4A to C are met in relation to the communications, it is to be regarded as directly only at investment prote protection professionals. In any other case in which one or more of the conditions set out in paragraphs 4A to C are met, that fact shall be taken into account in determining whether the communication is directed only at investment professionals, but a communication may still be regarded as directed even if none of the conditions of paragraph 4 is met. And then the conditions are A, the communication is accompanied by an indication that's directed at persons having professional experience of participating in unregulated schemes, and the units of which the communication relates are available only to such persons. B, the communication is accompanied by an indication that persons who do not have professional experience in unregulated investment, in, sorry, in unregulated, should not rely on it. C, there are in place proper systems and procedures to prevent recipients other than investment professionals from acquiring from the person directing the communication a close relative of his or a company in the same group units in which the scheme in which the communication relates. So those are the qualifying conditions and it, it doesn't really um, matter for present purposes but we would say that certainly uh, at the very least C looks highly questionable. Um, so you accept that Scots did make it clear that they were marketing it as an unregulated collective investment scheme to which Bismuth didn't apply? Uh, there's no doubt at all that this was being marketed as an unregulated collective investment scheme, my lady. No, I'm, I, um, I'm, but you're saying they didn't have a proper system in place to, to yes. check that? Yeah, yeah, I'm actually... Because the, the IM says in terms that that's the basis on which it yeah, is marketed. Yes, my, my lady, what I'm doing it for present purposes... Yeah is just highlighting what the statutory environment is in which you're then looking at how the 
uh, IM, which is admittedly an unregulated collective investment scheme, is to be in involved. I'm, I'm at the moment doing nothing more than right. that. But uh, the, my lady is right about the point I've just made. Then, in addition to um, in, in addition to that exemption, there are several others. But the one I want to draw attention to is certified high net worth individuals. Mm. 1450, 1459, that's one of those sort of almost Germanic words where everything's run together, high net worth individuals, where they can take the spaces out. Um, and then 21, if the requirements of paragraphs 4 and 5 are met, the scheme promotion restriction does not apply to communications, which is a non-real-time communication or a solicited real-time communication is made to a certified high net worth individual, relates only to units falling within six, doesn't invite or induce the recipient to enter into agreement on the terms which can incur a liability or obligation to pay or contribute more than he commits by way of investment. And then certified high worth net individual means any individual who has a current certificate of high net worth. I'm, uh, I'm and being a bit slow, Mr. Stewart, I'm so sorry. What, why are you showing us these exemptions? Yeah. Can you just because, explain because, to me? Yes, I'm showing you these exemptions because one of the points which is being made by my learned friend, both below and is at least partly accepted by the judge, yeah. is that it is important when you look at the information memorandum to take the view that all of this is directed only at IFAs. And I'm actually saying that no, the position is actually as straightforward about that. That's all I'm, I'm doing. But because was it argued below that there were exemptions and that some of these individuals some of these individuals should have been treated as direct recipients. I, I wasn't, I didn't spot uh, that. My, Lord, I, I, my lady, sorry, I, 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 I don't believe so, but right. can, I, can, I, can I just explain why the, yeah, this is I'm relevant? Struggling. Well, the critical point, um, which your ladyship is in advance of me on, is how one is to construe what we say are um, terms in documents, which when you understand the background of them, obviously don't have the meaning which they are now being put forward and obviously don't have the meaning that the judge found because if they did so they would make a nonsense both of the acceptance of responsibilities and so forth and of the whole statutory scheme against that backdrop all i'm doing for present purposes is showing you that the idea that this is simply a scheme where you can say it's an ifa we're only going to the ifa that's it is an oversimplification I can see that um, I should probably just show you Article 23, which is sophisticated investors, which is page 1465. And I, we don't need to go through them, but for present purposes, these are three different categories uh, of people who fall outside the scheme, and there are different requirements of them. And some of them, the high net worth individuals and the um, sophisticated investors, can have things direct, addressed to them directly, others of them can't. Could we go on that now, please, to the um, information memorandum yeah. itself? And uh, we've got the, the judge, understandably, concentrated on the SAD 1 memorandum, but I'm not going to go into that because there are some differences between SAD 2 and SAD 3. Mm. We're only dealing with SAD 2 and SAD 3. And for material terms, what matters is the terms of SAD 2 and SAD 3. You've got the information memorandum for SAD 2 and SAD 3 at Core Bundle 2, tab 23. Yeah. <coughs> and the judge refers in his judgment uh, to this in a whole series of ways, but can I just take you through it, drawing attention to what we say are the relevant provisions. The first is the notice, which is the first page on 360. And the notice has as its first paragraph, if you, i.e. the recipient of this document, are in any doubt about the contents of this document, you should consult your bank manager, stockbroker, solicitor, accountant, or other authorised financial advisor. So the very first sentence of this is plainly not directed to IFAs. And it is telling them nothing more 
then that if you're in doubt about the words, about the contents, you ought to go and see someone else. Then you see in the passage which my lady referred to that the second Scots uh, scheme, together with any other future um, partnerships, will be unregulated collective investment schemes as defined in section 235. So it's absolutely right that they are being told that. The partnership had not been authorised or otherwise approved by the Financial Services Authority, and as regulated schemes <coughs> cannot be marketed in the UK to the general public, accordingly this document is only directed at investment professionals falling within Article 14.5 and other exempt users to whom such order applies and persons who are otherwise permitted by law to receive it. Well, now you've seen the scheme, you understand that that's um, statutory, or that's, that's, as it were, shorthand for either IFAs or, amongst other things, sophisticated uh, investors or high net worth individuals. In other words, people who are exempted from the regulation. The investment to which this document relates is only available to such persons. Or well, just pausing there, there's a grammatical problem about that. It can plainly be such persons in terms of high net worth individuals or um, sophisticated investors. It's not only investment professionals. And one sees that from the terms in which the forms and so forth are made. Um, the, the exemptions refer, I closed the, the file, but it referred to being certified as a, high, as a sophisticated. Yes. Investor, was there evidence about them being certified? No, my lady, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm. 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 I'm not. I'm not. I don't mean this rudely, but I'm not. I'm not really interested about whether these people were or were not. We're not. We're not making a claim for no, the breach know, of these. But what? What I'm sorry. No, go on. Mm. Sorry. The, the the point I'm making is that when you're trying to work out what the words mean, to which the judge. Um, gave so much attention, when you understand the statutory background, you are left with a whole series of puzzles. And I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out some of them now. So the puzzle I was just, this, the investment to which this document relates is only available to such persons. Well, such persons is, for present purposes, IFAs, or high net worth individuals, or sophisticated investors, or the other people. And this document must not be relied on or acted upon by persons in the United Kingdom who do not have professional experience in participating in unregulated schemes and who are not exempt persons. So that's fine. You, but it's also consistent with, you can rely on the information in this document if you are, do have experience of um, in unregulated investment schemes and, and or you are an exempt person. And just to be plain where this is going, first indication in the second paragraph of the information memorandum that you're entitled to rely on the information which is contained within this document. Then you see in the third paragraph the um, uh, essential point that they're long-term illiquid uh, matters and that most of the pr protections under FISMA don't apply. So again, this is unregulated main plane. And then the fourth paragraph, something which we say is extremely important. Scots Atlantic Management Limited, the sponsor, is responsible for the information contained in this document. To the best of the knowledge and belief of the sponsor, which has taken all reasonable care to ensure that such is the case. The information contained in this document is in accordance with the facts, doesn't admit anything likely to affect the import of such information. The sponsor accepts responsibility accordingly. Now, against the statutory background, one can see absolutely what that is doing. It is saying, we're responsible for this, we're responsible for the facts, and by inference, we've got a statutory defence in relation for statements made by experts only in the context of a statute, if the expert is competent, that he's accepted responsibility for it, and so on and so forth. And what's more, just to flag the point which is in our skeleton argument. What this means, as we shall see, is that if Scots had received an opinion 
or advice or a letter or a telephone call from Mr. Thornhill saying, you know, I told you that you, uh, that everything in the taxation sense and so forth was accurate. I've now worked out that actually there's a real risk this isn't trading. Scots could not make this statement. And that that is so is absolutely plain on the front of this document. And one of the absurdities about my learned friend's case is that when you take to its natural conclusion, his construction of the documents upon which so much reliance was made in sort, what it means is that actually Scots could have been able to say, notwithstanding what we said on the front page, you're not entitled to rely on anything. And uh, we shall see that um, that plainly cannot be right. And with respect, no court would ever construe this document in such a way. Then you get another very important paragraph. For the avoidance of doubt, the rights owners are not responsible for any information contained in this document. So there you've got a disclaimer saying, for the avoidance of any doubt, for example, Warner Brothers or anyone else isn't responsible for anything contained in this, so don't try having a pop at them. No person is or has been authorised in connection with the partnerships and the participations to give any information to make any representation not contained in this document. Again, extremely important. We stand by what's in this document, but we're not authorised to do anything else. When one then comes to construe advice, don't try and say, well, I know what you said in the document, but we phoned up your secretary and he told us that in fact, uh, we didn't need to worry about X or Y. Um, if given or made, such information or representation must not be relied on as having been authorised by on behalf of the sp partnerships, the sponsor, the operator or the rights owners. And then next, statements and predictions made in this document are based on the interpretation of law and practice in force in the UK at the date of this document and are subject to changes in those laws and practices. My Lady, Lady Justice Silver's current point. Distribution of this document and the offering of participation may be restricted in certain jurisdictions. And then next, participations may only be acquired by persons resident for taxation purposes in the United Kingdom. Prospective applicants for participation should inform themselves as to the legal requirements and consequences of applying for, holding and disposing of participations and any other applicable exchange control regulation of taxes in their countries of respective citizenship, residence or domicile. First occasion upon which one gets reference to what I will call the difference between the general and the particular. Before you develop that, um, can I just take you back, Mr Stewart, please, to your submission by reference um, to the responsibility paragraph. Yes. Uh, one, two, three, four, four paragraphs down. You say that if you take the respondent's construction to its um, logical end, despite this assumption of responsibility, Scots, um, that th there could be no reliance on anything. Can you just, um, just so I understand it, just explain that submission to me? When you, when, you, when you get to the what, what the judge relies on in terms of the non-reliance sections, what this will do, I, it, on his construction, I'd say, would catch this express acceptance as well. In other words, that in simple terms, to construe this document properly, you've got to be looking to construe the documents together. And if you construe the documents together, the first important point is that you've got to give meaning to this document, that, sorry, this statement in paragraph four. A document, a single document as a whole, or documents together, or are you referring on to the warranties? And I'm, so I'm referring on to the warranties. I and see. and the, the, the reason for that, and, um, <coughs> I am happy to go there, but I would prefer to go 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 through it. But yeah, the, the reason, headline, so I, I understand but, the point. But, 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 but the reason for that is that when you get to the warranties which are relied on, they refer back, as you would expect, to the information memorandum. So you've got to look and see what those warranties mean in the context of the information memorandum. Thank you. That's out. what I wanted. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and, and sorry, the point I was just making, which is in relation to the paragraph participations may only be required, is this is the first of a number of different points at which the document makes plain that which you may think is obvious, which is that you've got a scheme which is being said to work, but you've obviously got to, as it were, be qualifying. You've got to be resident in the United Kingdom, you've got to have sufficient um, uh, income for the scheme. I mean, all, all sorts of individual points which will mean, well, we've got, a, as it were, a, 
a, a, a, a scheme here, mm. but you've actually got to be able to fulfill the requirements for it. And that's just the first of one of many. Um, then the next point, doesn't con constitute an offer or solicitation by or to anyone in any jurisdiction which such offer is not lawful. Then there's the standard United States exemption not to get absolute problems with the SEC. And then expressly at the bottom, not being registered under the United States Securities Act of 1933, etc. So what we've got on the front page of this document is express acceptance by Scots, obvious points being made as to certain highlighted matters, express non-acceptance by the rights owners. Then on page 362, you get the identification, first of all, of Ernst & Young, well, sorry, first of all, of Sponsor and Film Manager, Scott Atlantic Managers Limited, then the auditors, Ernst & Young, solicitors, Osborne Clark, and then taxation advisor to the sponsor and the partnership, Andrew Thornhill QC. Just pausing there, not that we say an enormous amount matters on this. What this does, of course, mean is that on the face of this document, unlike SAG 1, he wants the partnership is constituted as being expressly advised as the man who is advising the LLP of which the investors are going to be members. Then you get the summary of key points on page 363. Now, the key points starts off at the top by saying the following is qualified by in its entirety and should be read in conjunction with the more detailed information including with this in memorandum and in particular the risk factors on 19 and 20. Now, this is the first occasion when you get specific identification of the importance of risk factors. And the first factor which is identified is the partnership has been established to conduct the trade of acquiring by way of license honourable for the 5th of April and exploiting distribution rights to films in the territories from rights owners for a period of no less than 12 years. So right at the first key feature is this partnership is going to be carrying on a trade. And then second, <coughs> as a result of annual advances and shortfall guarantees provided by market services in relation to sales, the partnership would generate a profit over the trading period, together with the potential for a greater return, depending on the performance of the films. However, the marketing service providers will have the right at their sole discretion in offer to purchase the distribution rights after the 6th of April 2006. Now, this is a reference to uh, the call option. The economics of the call option, as are accepted, is that it's highly likely to be exercised. But in fact, as this makes plain, there is a legal entitlement uh, for a, um, as it were, an election. Then you get limited recourse borrowing will be available for investors in the partnership to fund 77.5% of their participation. So just on that, this is saying if you invest £100,000, um, you've got limited recourse uh, for uh, all, say, 27,500 of it. And you may be able to borrow the further 22.5% uh, because you've got full recourse filling uh, subject to satisfying frank criteria. So what this is meaning is you can put £100,000 in, um, you can immediately have limited recourse financing, which doesn't come back to you if the whole thing goes wrong, um, and you may be able to borrow the entire amount. And then fourth bullet point, as a result of expected trading losses in the first tax year, it is anticipated that tax relief arising would exceed the 22.5% balance of a partner's participation, accordingly would enable the repayment of any full recourse loans and would generate a surplus of approximately 17.5% of the participation of partners obtaining tax relief at 40%. See financial summary. Now, this is the absolute key bedrock of the tax advantages which are available. It's being highlighted and, as I have already said, without it, the investment makes no sense. Um, you get more description a little bit further down of the uh, call offer, uh, and um, I, d I don't propose to take you through the rest of that. You then get um, market background at 364, 
and I don't intend you to take you uh, through that. J just pausing, Th this is obviously all by reference to the film industry, but as my lady, Lady Justice Simler, has already uh, identified, it, it, it's not seeking to take advantage specifically of the specific relief to, reliefs which were engaged in relation to the film industry. C can I just, while we're um, on that point, also make the point that in the um, relevant Finance Act, which is uh, the uh, 1992 Finance Act, which you've got in bundle five at tab 42. Sorry, tab 45. This is um, special bonus for film schemes. Um, but, but the point is that in subsection 1 of section 43, it's subject to the following provisions of this section and any other provisions of the tax acts, in computing for tax purposes, the profits or gains accruing to a person in a relevant period from, and then these words, a trade or business which consists of or includes the exploitation of films. In other words, the statute itself does not define this as being, section 42 as being related to trades. It's trades or businesses. So you can't look and say, well, look, Parliament said that everything to do with the distribution of films are trades, because the statute itself is saying it could be a trade or it could be a business. G going back to the um, offer, page 365, You see the um, key terms, the opportunity, the partnership provides business opportunity for individuals to engage in the distribution of selected portfolio of feature films. And then the business, the partnership has been established to engage in the business and will acquire distribution rights to portfolios of films from rights owners for release on or before 5th of April with a distribution period of no less than 12 years. And just at the bottom of the page, you'll see the financing arrangements, which identify the um, little bit more detail, the points I've already made about the ability to borrow. And the last bullet point, the minimum participation for each partner is £102,000. No upper limit to the participation by any partner is subject to his or her overall tax requirements. So on the face of it, this is a scheme where you have to put in £102,000, which of course nets down because of the... Um, uh, tax relief, but you can put in if you've got enough taxable income as much as you want. And then we get the expected ta ta tax outcome under current UK legislation and published practice. Now, I, I, I pause there to emphasise that this is expected tax outcome under current UK taxation legislation and published practice. The published practice can only be there a reference to the Inland Revenue Manuals, established guidance. Anyone reading this will be saying, look, they've taken it into account and looked at what the revenue has to say. And then this SAML at Scots considers that the partnership will make a taxable loss in its first financial year. Such loss can be relieved against other income and capital gains of the tax year in which the loss arises in the immediately preceding year and against income arising in the last two tax years prior to that. See taxation consequences of investing in the partnership. So the very first attraction of this scheme is you get the first year tax losses. And it's an unequivocal statement. They can't possibly make it having accepted responsibility and having taken all reasonable care to do so without having obtained expert advice. <coughs> Their justification for making it will be, that's what Mr. Andrew Thornhill has told us. If Mr. Andrew Thornhill tells them something different, changes his mind at the last minute, says there's a risk, etc., etc., they're not going to be in a position to make that statement. 
And then so the first next... sentence is qualified by SAML's belief or consideration that the, the balance you say is a broad statement. Yes, and, and, that's and the point. yes, and and they're not in a. The, the, in order to, as it were, have a get out of jail card, they've got to be able to rely on what's the ground for your consideration when well, we went to tax council who um, signed off and etc. in relation to it. If that changes, then this statement has to change. And then the next bullet point, for a higher rate taxpayer obtaining a limited recourse loan, it's anticipated the tax relief in respect to the first financial year, other by way of repayment of tax or reduction of lack, would be more than sufficient to return the amount subscribed from either a partner's own resources or from a fully recourse bank loan and leave a partner with an amount equal to approximately 17.5% of their participation. So in other words, if you subscribe to this scheme, you can borrow, you'll get the tax relief, and you'll be left with 17.5% in cash of your participation. And then they set out the two possible taxation alternatives, depending upon whether or not the call option is exercised. I, I, I don't want to go through that, but all of this is how the scheme works. And you then get the funds flow diagram on 367. You get on 368 the financial summary, and this is actually quite helpful to look at. You look at the um, position in the event that the call options are exercised and you are looking at a um, possible situation where you're funding £225,000. You're down um, £225,000 because of your initial participation of the bank loan call down and re repayment in the first year. Then you're up at the end of the second year and you're up and so forth through until the call option is exercised at in, in 2006. If the um, position is not ended and goes through to 2017, then you're down, but you've had the opportunity to invest this cash over a very long period of time, and provided your hurdle rate is sufficient, you end up on top. So, just to make the obvious, <laughs> Without the tax relief, this scheme plows into the water absolutely straight away. Then um, you get the, um, a different example at 369, which we don't need to look at. And then you get through the description of the um, fees and so forth. At 370, just at little one, you see that Scots getting 77.1... Page 369, have you taken us to that? I, I'm, I'm sorry, my lady. It's I, the bottom of page 369, yes. It's, I, I, 3, 369 is, is essentially just another example, a worked example. But in the bottom, have you... Example uh, oh, yeah, sorry, the figures shown are by way of example only. They are not and shouldn't be construed as forecast the likely returns from participating in partnership. Partners should take independent financial taxation rights in relation to their own circumstances. Sorry, I should have picked up that. Uh, just, just pausing there. What does own circumstances mean in that context? In my submission, it means your own personal position. It doesn't mean whether the scheme works or not. Sorry, my lady, I should I should have done my fault. <coughs> I was then just going to look briefly at 370 and just um, draw attention to the fact that Scots taking 7.1% of the aggregate part participation, so they're, um, they're um, taking a hefty fee, um, being paid for um, essentially by Her Majesty's ex Exchequer if the, um, if the scheme works. Uh, and then on 371, we get the identification of the sponsor and film manager. And then on 372, we get uh, Mr Thornhill being introduced. The tax analysis set out herein is based on the sponsor's understanding of current UK tax legislation and published practice, published practice again, re reference to revenue practice, 
and the UK generally accepted accounting practice. However, prospective members are advised to consult their tax advisors and are referred to the risk factors on pages 19 and 20. I want to take this paragraph together with the next one. While no advanced ruling procedures are available in the UK for transactions such as this, advice has been received from Mr Andrew Thornhill QC, a senior UK tax counsel and head of pump court tax chambers in respect of tax and from Ernst & Young in respect of accounting policies. And the financial summary is consistency with those policies and with the tax advice received from Mr Thornhill. Copies of the opinions of counsel and advice from Ernst & Young are available from the sponsor. Now, in my submission, these two paragraphs, first of all, have to be read together, and I make a number of points about them. The first, the reference to no advance ruling are available in the UK for transactions such as this. Well, that's true. What it's saying is we can't guarantee in this situation the taxation consequences, but we have done the next best thing. We've gone to Andrew Thornhill, QC, senior UK tax head and the head of chambers, and he's told us that the um, financial summary is consistency with those policies and the tax advice received from Mr Thornhill. And for what it's worth, Ernst & Young have also told us that what we've said complies with UK GAAP. But that sentence, that first sentence of the second paragraph doesn't in fact say, you've got to read into it, haven't you, that there is consistency. What it says is there is advice in respect of policies and the financial summary's consistency with those policies and with the tax advice received. You've well, got to read in, have you, that it's, it is consistent and the tax advice is supportive. Well, you, you, you do have to, but, but, but you, you're bound to do that because of the point I've already made, which is that, that Scots are saying this is what their belief is. If you were to try and put forward a memorandum... Sorry, the belief, this is what Scots' belief is. The, belief the, the tax, tax analysis set out here is based on the sponsor's understanding of current so, UK tax... So the sponsor understands this to be the tax analysis, see the, the worked out um, exercises, and, and it's... One reads in the advice confirms that uh, that analysis is consistent with because because, the because otherwise opinion. otherwise you're falling directly foul of the acceptance <laughs> of responsibility on the page page one How, and 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 when we get to it the risk factors. Now, so the first point was no advanced guidance. Uh, other than in this room will. Um, no, far more than I. I mean, th there are in certain circumstances the possibility to go into the revenue and get advance clearance of particular um, financial transactions. They certainly won't do it in relation to anything which they consider as tax avoidance um, or anything of that nature. Uh, and, and so that's the context. But it is recognising, third point, the centrality of the relief and to a reasonable reader this is saying we haven't done that, but we've done the next best thing. Third point, and I've really all um, really made this, it's not only in accordance with current UK tax legislation, it's also in accordance with published practice. Coming back to the point I made about the judges. <coughs> Fourth point, the sentence at the end of the first paragraph, however, prospective members are advised to consult their tax advisors are referred to the, risk of factor, to the risk factors, has to be read together and by reference to the risk factors and does not amount, in my submission, to anything approaching a disclaimer, nor... Would it make unreasonable reliance on the advice being given either by Scots or Mr Thornhill? This is what we think. 
we can't get a clearance from the revenue, but we've gone to UK Tax Council. Implicitly, this is all fine. It's in concurrence with what we've done. It's in accordance with, you, um, with the um, revenue practice. That doesn't get rid of the reasonableness of reliance. Can I um, <coughs> then just go, because this is a critical feature, I, I need to come back to some of the other points, but can we just go then to the risk factors? Because it's, it's in this context that one gets uh, the advice. The risk factors are at page 377. Partners, partners of the partnership consider the potential risks of investing therein, which include but are not limited to the following. <coughs> First, relating uh, primarily to the partnership and its operation, that's effectively saying it hasn't been traded. Currency risk, self-explanatory. Failure of guarantee, um, supporter of letter of credit and so forth. Then tax risk. This document, positive statement, has been prepared on the basis of current UK tax legislation and Inland Revenue published practices, concessions and interpretations. So again, um, direct reference to effectively HMRC's manual. If these change, or if the levels and bases of taxation change as a result of amendments to the law, the performance of this investment may be adversely affected. Such changes may be applied retrospectively. So the first warning is that the government can change the law and may do so retrospectively. Second, the tax analysis outlined in this document may not apply to a partner who isn't resident or ordinary resident for tax purposes in the United Kingdom. So that's telling you um, you need to be extremely careful if you're not tax resident in the UK. Third, the Inland Revenue doesn't give advance rulings on any of the tax issues referred to in this document. Well, we know that, we've seen that at the top, but they've gone to Andrew Thornhill. The availability of tax reliefs depends on the Inland Revenue's acceptance of, of the partnership accounts and the computations, tax computations in compliance with detailed rules. Well, so far as that's concerned, yes, of course it does. But before you get to partnership accounts, whether the accounts are right, and whether they've complied with de detailed rules, there's the a priori question, is this trading? Does it work? So that paragraph read together can't possibly be said, we're warning you that there's any real risk of this um, scheme as a whole not working. Then expressly, tax analysis outlined in this document may not apply to a partner who is resident or ordinary resident for tax purposes. In, in, sorry, I've read that already. Um, then um, a partner may have a liability of class two or class four, depending on his or particular circumstances. So that's again a particular circumstances risk. Inland Revenue has the right to inquire into any tax loss relief or interest relief made by any partner. Well, that's true. An individual's tax position depends on his or her particular circumstance. There is no guarantee that the Inland Revenue will agree that the tax relief described in this document will be applicable to that individual. Well, that's an individual risk. Top of the page, 378, there is some risk that a non-resident partner who is deemed to retire from the partnership may suffer a clawback of tax relief previously claimed in respect of trading losses or interest or any borrowings by non to finance the acquisition. Etc. And then just before we get to general risks, current inland pra practice will treat partners as associated for the purposes of establishing the small companies rate for corporation tax in respect of companies which they control, etc. So what you have here in my submission is nothing of any kind whatsoever to suggest that there is any real risk of the scheme as a whole failing. Apart from potentially that sentence that says that the uh, availability depends on the revenue accepting the partnership accounts and tax computations, because if the revenue challenges the partnership's trading status, it won't accept its accounts and tax computations. I, I, I agree, my lady, but equally, it could accept the trading statements, st uh, status and still challenge the computations and so forth, because it could say, well, you're trading, but we don't actually agree that this should be allowed or that should be allowed. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be, but, but, but lady, read in, read in, read in context, um, th there is another way of looking at this. 
and, and we can see it in a minute when we get to how the, the question which is dealt with about the non-resident partner is dealt with. If there is any statement by Mr Thornhill of any real risk whatsoever, that's got to be flagged up as number one risk in this transaction. There is a real risk, but actually this scheme won't work at all. Now, in the real world, that wouldn't have happened because no one's going to buy this scheme on that basis. This only works off the back of the Thornhill endorsement, and it only works off there is no doubt. This is the equivalent. This is the equivalent of she's a good little bus and I'd stake my life on her. <laughs> no, it is. It's just, a, it's just a great, great. We are going to, you know, <laughs> the, the claimant was made out of yes, two it's cars. It's a good little Doncaster two. The, 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 front, the front half was yeah. different from the back half. Yeah. <laughs> the, claimant, the claimant will win and the damages will be enormous. Yeah. It's all right if he does win and the damages are enormous. Okay. Yeah. It's Volta. Um, can we go back, please? Um, so now in, you... answer to, in answer to the question, perhaps putting my lady's question a different way, um, you say Mr Thornhill did not give any qualifications to the advice he gave. But when you look at the IM as a whole, uh, could it be said that actually it, the document did give that, and that qualification? No, you couldn't possibly say it gave that qualification. But but, 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 we're looking at tax risks. You would say you couldn't say, well, as it happens, Whereas as a whole, the IM does give uh, what you would say would be the necessary qualification to the otherwise well, unapplicable My lady, you're, you're falling into the judge's mistake. Yeah. It's not the necessary qualification. This whole document is saying this scheme will work. It's not a question of saying... If you're going to say um, this scheme may not work, it's not a question of qualifying it. That might be the case. If you had a situation where, you know, you say council have said that it should work, but there's some fundamental problem. This is all saying this scheme will work. There is no doubt about it. Is that right? Is it, well, or sure is it saying that. the sponsor believes the scheme will work, but uh, the revenue may uh, not accept the partnership accounts and tax computations, and you should... Uh, consult your tax advisors about the risk factors. About what? But well, the risk factors don't have in the main risk factor. Well, the, the, but the elephant in the room is, we believe the tax, the scheme is going to work, but consult your advisors to but, see. You know, it's, it's, with, with respect, my lady, I, I'd say absolutely not that. Okay. And, and the reason I say it's absolutely not that is, is this. The, the, this is promoting it's saying we've got expert advice from Mr Thornhill that this scheme will work. Now, everyone knows that there is a chance that a professional advisor will be wrong. But if a professional advisor who allows his name as an expert to be put in gives that advice in order to induce people to buy, there can be no doubt the reason why Thornhill's name here is to sell this scheme, and he knows it. If he's then negligent, the fact you said, well, you might want to consider with your professional advisor whether there's something which brackets everyone can know, which is the revenue might not accept your, and that's an adequate warning in order to preclude the reliance, that would turn the English law into a nonsense. The investor in Candler and Crane Christmas knew that the accounts might be wrong, that doesn't mean to say that he wasn't entitled to rely on them. Now, my lady, I, I suspect that the members of this court have probably have enough knowledge about tax schemes, certainly now, to think that, on the whole, the game may not be worth the candle. It probably doesn't particularly matter. But looking at it from the point of view of selling this as an investment, the idea that just because you know that the revenue may not accept it, but you've been told it should work, and you've been told it should work because of the imprimatur of um, Andrew Thornhill, Queen's Council, and you can't rely on it, would take us back more than 75 years in terms of where the law should be. Um, 
th this is, we are on the absolute critical point of the case, although we haven't yet got to the, to the warranties, etc. cetera, but, but, but they're important as well. Um, but I, subject to that, could, could I, um, uh, just on general risks, actually. If we you disassociate the risk advice with the positive advice from counsel, effectively. Well, I, I put it the other the other way around. The whole of this there, document, but, the whole. But, sorry. Sorry, the advice is there, um, with all its um, gravitas, but uh, and therefore you say the fact that you get advised, as it were, separately that there may be the the you know, revenue may not accept it or. And so on and so forth, um, doesn't dilute the force of the advice in the first place. Is that, is that yeah, yeah, absolutely? It doesn't destroy your intention to rely on, on this. Sorry, your, your ability to rely on this as a matter of law. I, I come back to the endorsement which was given by Lord Bridge as to what the law ought to be. Can I just um, do two things before a short adjournment? Can we just look at a couple of the general risks, which are on mm -hmm. 378? Yeah. General risks, the first of them, investment in the partnership involves substantial risks, including certain tax risks. Well, in my submission, that fairly refers to the tax risks which are identified on the previous page at 377. Risks associated with the lack of liquidity of the investment and risks associated with the film businesses. And then there's a statement about they may compete with each other and so forth. Um, just about halfway down the page, there's a paragraph or a bullet point. The opportunity described herein best suits higher rate taxpayers with sufficient income or capital gains to absorb their share of the expected initial trading losses. So this is saying, what is a statement to the obvious, which is that you want to be able to take advantage of the tax losses and you need to be a higher rate taxpayer in order to do so. And then there are um, various other matters um, identified I was then proposing to go back to where we left off, um, which is the uh, um, 372. Yeah, 372. And what we then get <coughs> in relation to the tax analysis set out herein is the positive advice that is being given. So we've looked at the risk factors, and then we get the first tax year. The partnership will undertake the trade of acquiring by way of license and exploiting distribution rights to films in the territories and trading period. The partnership, based only upon the revenues from the annual advances and the shortfall guarantees, is budgeted to be profitable over the trading period. However, unless the performers perform exceptionally well, anticipated the partnership will employ a trading loss in the first tax year, sorry, in the first financial year, will not recoup any more than the annual advantage, etc. And then they explain the reasons. And then income tax relief is um, main way of dealing with the losses are as follows. Paragraph one is all about getting your reliefs. Two is then dealing with capital gains tax relief. And then at the bottom in a, in a bit in blue, Claims for all the above losses and relief need to be made within one year from 31st of January, following a year of assessment in which the loss arises. Note the loose of such losses may result in personal allowances and lower tax rate tax bans not being fully utilised. Similarly, there may be implications for tax relief on personal pension contributions, retired annuities, and other tax efficient investments. Um, and then, if we can then go to the application procedure, which is on the last page, on page 379. Um, general, subscribers must be individual UK tax residents. Interest in the partnership may not be promoted or sold directly to the public. Applications will therefore only be considered when received via a duly authorised intermediary. 
Um, so you're, you're getting these applications via an intermediary. And then the procedure is identified. And what's been referenced, the subscription agreement, the deed of adherence, and so forth. Then there's some stuff about money laundering. And then you've got the minimum capital contribution for each partner is £100,000. Uh, and it's explained how that relates to the figure of £102,000, which you have seen earlier. Now, th those are the passages I wanted to look at in the IAM. Well, would it be convenient to drop now and stop, um, yeah. stop now on the basis we're now going to turn to another document as part of the Okay, time. two o'clock then, please. All right.